Welcome, my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and the creator of the Lead Building System. Today is a momentous day for us. We're gonna be presenting for the first time ever the full Lead Building System in a single presentation. We've uh, been building this over the course of seven years. It's been one of the biggest endeavors of my professional career, and it's uh, an amazing and exciting opportunity for us to share with you something that has been uh, a huge passion of mine for a number of years. So I wanted to start by saying uh, I am a business storyteller. I spent 15 years at uh, NPR, PBS, The Washington Post as a professional storyteller, as a journalist, and then transition uh, to digital marketing where I have spent the last seven years being a digital marketer and educating other small businesses about how to market themselves online. And today uh, we are gonna be talking about what is really the culmination of that career of work first as a storyteller and then as a marketer and how I've been able to combine my backgrounds as a journalist and as a marketer into this system. So our goals today are for you to learn about and understand what is the BizHack lead building system. We're gonna offer you a number of case studies of the lead building system in action, and we're gonna provide you a roadmap for how to get started with selling to strangers online or online lead generation. So the challenge that many of you face is that you are limited in time, money and expertise. To be honest, you don't have much going for you. Um, the small business marketing challenge is the biggest challenge in all of marketing. And for this reason, what we found is a lot of business owners really struggle on who to hire, how to measure success, and where to start. You find that marketing agencies are too expensive or ineffective. The digital marketing bros who are out there selling snake oil um, have huge promises that they can't deliver on. And oftentimes when you actually try to do the research yourself, what you find is this Gartner map. This is the map that Gartner created, one of the top think tanks in the country, about all of the elements of digital marketing that any business should take into account. And if you're a Fortune 500 company, you better know <clears throat> the Gartner map. The problem is if you're a small business limited in time, money, and expertise, this map is overwhelming and there's no clear starting point. What business owners really need and what BizHack aims to provide is to be a trusted partner, a proven system, and implementation support. You really want to be able to trust the person you're working with. You want to have a system that you can use and repeat, and you want to have help getting started using that system. And that's really where the BizHack Lead Building System, or LBS, comes in. It has three elements, which we're going to talk about today. The six pillars, the foundation, and the nine steps. And we have been building this over seven years with 700 businesses. So what is the LBS? It starts with the foundation, your business story. Sorry, it's auto advancing on me. It starts with your foundation, your business story. And that really comes down to what is your why? Next is, let me just pop out of here for one sec. Sorry about that. So it really starts with the foundation of what is your business story? Uh, what is the why of your business? And we're gonna talk about that in more detail. Next is the six pillars, objective, audience, offer, video, message, and call to action. And we're gonna dig into each one of these today. And then finally, the nine step process. How do you actually implement this in your own business? We call this run an ad, run another ad wash, rinse, repeat. And this is really the curriculum that we walk people through who participate in our program. In 2019, BizHack trained 112 small businesses in the lead building system. And on average, they earned $29 in revenue for every $1 in ads. That's a ROI of 29 to one. 
And this is a training that actually paid for itself. So for example, in the home services industry, we have Yoel Gutierrez who runs Mosquito Joe of Miami. Um, Mosquito Joe is a uh, home services company. They're a pest control company. And they, during the course of the program, spent about $1,000 in ads and generated over the course of the lifetime of those customers, $30,000 in revenue. Another example is um, Neto Almanza, who runs a education company. This is a school called the San Jorge School based in Mexico. They uh, use this system to triple enrollment, which led to more than a million dollars in increased tuition over the course of their uh, uh, lifetime of student, uh, the student's lifetime with them. And then finally, in the health and wellness space, we have Otero Dental Centers, who use Facebook messaging marketing to spend $2,700 to generate nearly $150,000 in new patients. So let's talk about the foundation of the lead building system. It all starts with storytelling. I don't know if you know this, but IBM has a chief storyteller, but it's not just IBM. You can see that also Microsoft, GE, SAP, and many others. Nike hired its first chief storytelling officer in the 1990s. So what the heck is a chief storyteller? Well, if you are a small business owner, you are your company's chief storyteller. Leading your company is an act of storytelling. Raising capital from banks or investors is about storytelling. Painting a picture through numbers and strategy of what you're aiming to achieve. Sales, of course, is storytelling. And then advertising and marketing is storytelling. As I mentioned, my background is as a storyteller. And so that is the lens through which I look at digital marketing. And that is the way in which we educate folks on digital marketing through the foundation, through their business story. So the foundation is telling your business story online. And another metaphor that we use to describe this is the communications diamond. So think about a diamond. A diamond has many facets. And so depending on which way you look, a different facet or side of the diamond will shine. That's a way to think about marketing channels. So you have Facebook, you have Google, you have your website, you have TikTok, you have LinkedIn, you have text messaging, you have email. All of those are different ways to communicate with strangers or customers online. What needs to be consistent is the story that you tell, the essence of your company, the communications diamond. And so we believe at BizHack that your business story is the foundation of all of your communications. And then it gets to be a lot less complicated when you have to think about which facet you're going to talk about and to whom, then it really is much more tactical. You know what you're going to say, you're going to express your business story to them. So what is your business story? For a business owner, it's your deeply personal motivation for starting your business, your origin story. It communicates your purpose and your passion. It answers the question, if your business were to disappear, how would the world be worse off? Every organization from Fortune 500 companies to startups have a business story. And if you don't define your business story, your competitors will do it for you. We're going to now run through a few examples uh, in, in the next few minutes of different Fortune 500s and small businesses who've gotten really good at expressing their business story. So why bother? Why bother telling your story? First of all, people are hardwired to respond to a moving story. They motivate your target audience to action, and they um, they are ultimately the business story unlocks your power uh, as an online marketer. One of the big insights that we really believe in comes from Simon Sinek, which is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so the first step in figuring out your business story is to talk about your story of me, sometimes called your core purpose or why you do what you do. And so Simon Sinek says, start with why. 
why you do what you do, and then talk about the how and the what. So for instance, Biz Hacks Why is we champion the underdog so you can thrive. Our what, we call the three C's, content, coaching, and community. And our how is how we teach it is through storytelling, strategy, and software. So look back again at the golden circle. We start with our why, we help underdogs thrive, then our how, and then our what. Typically, businesses start with their what, and then they talk about their how and their why. Now, let me show you with BizHack's example how much more powerful it is to start with why. BizHack is a company dedicated to helping underdogs uh, thrive, helping small businesses thrive so you can have the life and the business that you dreamed of. How do we do this? We do this through the three C's, coaching, community, and content. And what do we do to teach you this? We use a combination of storytelling, strategy, and software to help you achieve your greatest dreams. Now let's flip it, same words. What do we do? BizHack uses storytelling, strategy, and software to teach small businesses. We do that through content, coaching, and community. And the reason we do it is because we champion the underdog so they can thrive. Same words, same ideas. When you start with why, it's just far more powerful. So one of the ways that we have found that's very powerful, we learned this from scaling up, is a worksheet called the Core Purpose Worksheet, or what we call at BizHack, the why chain, which is what is your purpose or passion in starting with your starting your company and why is that important why does that matter so what we would recommend is that you sit with uh this worksheet or you can even um part you know have someone sitting across from you and have them just ask for you why is that important to you why does that matter to you why is this important to you why does that matter um and the deeper you get down this why chain the closer you get to the core purpose and your ultimate passion for starting your company. The story of me is then an anecdote from your life that encapsulates your why, your passion and your purpose. And these are some questions that you can ask is, why is this business so personally motivated for me? What motivates me to risk so much and work so hard? When I'm in the midst of the trough of sorrow, what gets me through? Why do I do this? And what I've found is that oftentimes the why comes from a lesson from your parents, a lesson from childhood. Sometimes this is a lesson in the positive where you're modeling or emulating uh, what your parents taught you. Sometimes it's a lesson in the negative where you're trying to create a different scenario than what many of the other people uh, than, than, than what your parents might have been able to provide for you. But we are imprinted from before age 18 with our values, and then we live out those values for the rest of our life. And the more in touch you are with why you do what you do, the more powerfully you'll be able to market your company. So I want to talk to you very quickly about my story of me. We talked about champion the underdog so they can thrive. Well, I thought a lot about where this comes from. And for me, it really starts with my mother, who is a inner city school teacher. She taught art uh, to some of the hardest cases in inner city Philadelphia, even though we lived in a really nice ritzy suburb and I went to nice public schools in the suburbs, my mom always drove into town and taught in inner city Philadelphia. And towards the end of her career, she worked at Philadelphia Regional High School, which was a high school for dropouts, folks who had left high school and then were coming back to get their degree. And they had a full-time daycare. And a lot of these kids uh, were, um, had really rough upbringings and were, you know, getting a high school diploma was a huge deal for them. Now, art was an elective, but they would come, they would flock to her class and they would ask Mrs. Gretsch for advice. And in the end, she became a, an informal guidance counselor, helping get many of them into college, like she helped me get into college. And then eventually, she actually became the guidance counselor for the school, finding that guidance counseling was an even better way for her to express her passion and her purpose. And I, as a, as a teenager, would go down 
to see my mom, to visit her in her school, to meet these kids and saw the love and passion and meaning that she derived from working with them. And here I am 30 years later and I've created a company. Uh, it teaches digital marketing to small businesses, but at its essence and at its core, it's about helping the underdog thrive. That's why I love working with small businesses, the hardest cases, and I love seeing life transformation just like my mom. So that's my story of me. But my story of me alone is not enough. You must also tell the story of us. The story of us is where you connect your personal experience with the needs and wants of small bit uh, of your potential audience. So for example, in my case, um, I have a passion for helping underdogs thrive. And I understand as a small business owner, how difficult it is to understand and learn digital marketing. I have been swindled by digital marketing agencies that I've hired. Um, I've uh, tried myself to learn it, getting caught in the rabbit hole of Facebook ads and software I didn't really need or understand. Um, I've been dazzled by dashboards. I've been run around the ringer in my efforts as a small business owner, as an entrepreneur to learn digital marketing. And having gone through that experience, I don't want anyone else to have to search for a trusted source for this kind of information. And that's why I created BizHack. And that is how I want to help underdogs thrive by giving them the, the technical tools, the strategy and the storytelling that they need in order to market their business to sell to strangers. That's how I connect my story of me about being a kid going to my mom's school to my story of us, of how I uh, have a passion and purpose to help small businesses with digital marketing. And um, you'll see that the biggest companies in the world do this uh, often beautifully. So I'm gonna share now um, Howard Schultz uh, talking about how Starbucks um, core values and its passion and purpose came about. My father was a uh, World War II veteran, high school dropout, and came back from the war with yellow fever and unfortunately ended up really not realizing the aspiration of the American dream he thought he was going to come home to after the war. He was a delivery driver picking up and delivering cloth diapers before the invention of Pampers. And in March of 1960, on a delivery, he fell on a sheet of ice and fractured his ankle and broke his hip. The injury caused him to get fired. No workman's compensation, obviously no health insurance. When I was seven years old, I literally came home from school, opened the apartment door, and saw my father laid out on a couch with a cast from his hip to his ankle. Listen, at the age of seven, how could I possibly understand the impact that would have on me? But it, it scarred me to watch and witness my parents and my mother just go through such a hard time. As so I want to pause because that's the story of me, about a seven-year-old Howard Schultz who is witnessing his father being abandoned by his employer and not having a safety net that he feels he was entitled to as an employee. Rather, they just dropped him like a hot potato. So then the question is, well, what the heck does that have to do with overpriced lattes? And now listen to the next two dozen words and you'll see how he connects that story of me to the story of us, to the story of Starbucks. As I got older, I think I've always been sensitized to people living on the other side of the tracks. And as Starbucks evolved, I think I was trying to build the kind of company my father never got a chance to work for. A company that would try and balance profit with conscience. Balance profit with conscience. That is a masterful example of how he was able to pivot this experience he had as a seven-year-old into the story 
of Starbucks, the story of a company that tries to balance profit with conscience. And Howard Schultz is one of the great business storytellers out there. And that is a highly honed and polished and focus grouped story that he's telling there, even though it sounds like he's just rattling off an anecdote, he's using that as a precise uh, tool to help create sympathy, motivation, uh, and leadership. But it doesn't have to just be the heads of Fortune 500 companies who do this. You can do it too, and you can put it in all sorts of places. You can put it on your Facebook business page. Uh, Facebook allows you to put my company story uh, on your business page. A lot of folks ignore it or don't fill it in. That's an incredibly important place for you to put your business story. You can put it in your LinkedIn profile. Above that resume bullet points is a little section where you can talk about why you do what you do and what your passion is. That's a great place for your story of me, story of us. You can actually put it onto your website as a message from the founder. Uh, I strongly recommend that small business owners have communication directly from the founder to the audience. You're a small business. You, you know, you don't need to hide behind your brand. Um, you should be out front and out center. People want to do business with you when you're getting started and you don't want to hide from that. And then finally, we have created a business directory. Uh, we had our holiday gift guide for the holidays. And this is an example of one of the beautiful stories of me from Gabrielle Velez of Heaven of Joy. This is a small e-commerce company that primarily sells scented candles and other products on Amazon. And what Gabrielle said in his business directory is, when I was two years old, I lost my father and my little sister. My mom raised me, which was hard for her in a society where women are not always equal. I believe that all women are entitled to experience joy in this world and find their true beauty within. So he connected his experience being raised by a single mother after the tragic death of his father and sister to the work he's now doing providing uh, products for uh, primarily oriented towards women. And this is, this takes it from being a candle to being a mission. Another example is Cristobal Giddy of Machido Karate Miami. Cristobal talked about his, um, his father who taught him karate when he was four years old. He said, my father had been a rambunctious kid in his native Chile and karate channeled his prodigious energy. He was a well-known architect in Santiago de Chile, but when my family moved to Miami, he had to start over and he started his own karate studio. After high school, I followed my own path. I got a call. I got a good job administering a server farm in Hialeah, a technical job. Then the call came. My father was dying of lung cancer and he wanted me to take over the dojo. I was 28. So that's Cristobal's story of me. Now look at his story of us. How does this connect to us maybe being a part of his dojo? For the past two decades, I've run a karate studio in Pinecrest with the values my father taught me of an unbending will and undying commitment to my students. Now more than ever, we need to train our bodies and minds to endure, and I am here to serve you. Another beautiful example of this is Byron Kibbert of the Runner's High. This is an elite runner's shoe store. And Byron, uh, when I asked him about why he runs a, sh a shoe store, started talking about his mother. He said, my mother was a huge inspiration for me. She worked at Homestead Air Force Base and was a top Avon lady in South Florida. She didn't stop when she was diagnosed with MS. She'd put the wheelchair in her car to deliver orders. So what the heck does this have to do with running an elite shoe store? Here is the story of us. Now I run a shoe store to help people with mobility issues. We're more than a running shoe store. We're a comfort shoe store. I love and enjoy helping people with mobility issues who genuinely need our expertise. My mom has been gone for 27 years, but I knew she would be really proud of me. And what was so impressive when I talked to Byron Kibort about this 
is that he had never connected in all of these years, three decades in the business, his mother's limited mobility issues with his passion for running a shoe store. And to me, it seemed so clear that he was about way more than just elite running. He was about comfort. And why would he be so interested in mobility issues and comfort shoes? And the second we started digging into that is when we unearthed the story of his mother. And I asked Byron, do you think it's an accident? Do you think it's a coincidence that you've dedicated your life and your business to helping people with mobility issues when your mother, your beloved mother, had mobility issues herself? And that's when he said, my mom's been gone for 27 years, but I know she'd be really proud of me because of this business that I run. Here's someone who for three decades ran a business without really fully understanding why he did it, without fully understanding his origin story. Now that he understands it, he can be even more inspiring, even more passionate, even more powerful as a marketer and get even more people to do business with him uh, by telling his story of why he does it. This is something that really differentiates a lot of small businesses from other, um, uh, from other types of businesses. Your story of me and story of us is something that none of your competition can match. And it's something that you need to get good at telling. So now I want to talk to you guys about the six pillars. Remember, we talked about the business foundation. Uh, the, the foundation of the lead building system is your story of me, is your business story. Next are the six pillars that you build atop that solid foundation. And those six pillars are objective, audience, offer, video, message, and call to action. And to go through these six pillars, we're gonna use a learning tool called, which is the Facebook ad. The reason that we use the Facebook ad is digital marketing, as we saw earlier, is a vast and complicated field. And you have to start somewhere. We have found over seven years doing this that the best and easiest place to start is the Facebook ad. So just like when you're learning modern dance, like my eight-year-old daughter, she's getting a foundation in ballet. And just like when you want to learn how to play the guitar or the flute, you might learn your scales on the piano. We have come to believe that the Facebook ad is the ideal starting point for any learning journey in digital marketing. There are a couple of reasons for this. Number one, uh, a Facebook ad will get you in the almost immediate results. Uh, advertising as opposed to organic uh, or, or free posts. With advertising, you get almost immediate sense of whether what you're doing is working. So that feedback loop is really fast. Number two, a Facebook ad uh, is cheaper than a Google ad or a LinkedIn ad or almost any other kind of ad. So it's an easier, uh, you can spend less money in your testing and learning, so you don't have to spend as much. Third is Facebook is ubiquitous. Just about everyone who's on the internet, about 80% of people on the internet in the United States have a Facebook or Instagram account. Instagram's owned by Facebook. And that's a similar percentage of people who use Google to search online. A lot of people who are in the B2B space will say, well, why don't we start with LinkedIn? Well, LinkedIn has about a quarter of the population on it, and people tend to check LinkedIn a fraction as often as they check Facebook. So Facebook has your ideal customer, whether you're a B2B or B2C or B2G, they are there, and they are checking it more often than they're checking, say, LinkedIn or some of the other platforms. And so for that reason, Facebook, for most businesses, is an ideal place to start. This doesn't mean you don't do LinkedIn. It's just more of a both end kind of situation. It doesn't mean you don't do Google ads, but Google ads are far more complex and difficult to learn than Facebook. The setup at Facebook is easier and more intuitive and more graphic and frankly, just uh, a lot easier for a start, for someone who's getting started to, to, to use. Now, I just want to quickly define our terms here because a lot of people get really confused about boosted posts versus ads. Boosted posts are basically taking your status update, also known as an organic post, and boosting it or getting it to reach more people. 
An ad is built in a completely different part of Facebook and it has a lot more capability. So again, the organic post is no dollars spent. The problem, as many of us have learned with organic posts on Facebook, on our Facebook business pages is not many people see them. Facebook does not allow business posts to reach many folks uh, without having to pay. So Facebook has really become a pay to play. The two options in terms of paying are boosting and ads. And it doesn't cost any less money to run an ad. An ad is the same uh, amount of money, but it's much more powerful and much more effective as you can see in this chart. There are so much more, more thing, there are so many more things you can do with an ad than a boosted post. The thing that really is limiting you with an ad is just knowledge. And so take that extra time, learn how to run an ad, and you'll get better results. So this is uh, yet another reason why we recommend the Facebook ad is the place to start. As I go through these pillars, I'm gonna be talking about a business called Ascendance Studios. Ascendance Studios is run by Rafael Savino and Valentina Bagala. They, it is a uh, dance studio for teens uh, near Miami, Florida. And they had a challenge. Their challenge was that their summer camps were empty. Um, and so they had a 12 week summer camp and they saw that towards the end of the summer, they had less than 50% enrollment. Students would pay by the week and they also found that only 9% of students were enrolled in more than six of the 12 weeks. And so with the help of BizHack, we helped them implement a brand new marketing strategy, which included new pricing and online marketing from various ways. They created a free trial class called Move with the Minions, where they had people dressed up as minions and they promoted that online, both organically and through ads. They offered significant discounts for multi-week packages. That was their new pricing strategy. They promoted this on their Facebook business page and their website. They ran Facebook ads, they ran Google ads, and they started a referral program to help promote word of mouth, asking parents to tell their friends. And then finally, um, they used social media to help communicate with the teenage girls who were their um, customers, or at least the, the children of their target customers, the, the dance moms, and they wanted to kind of create a groundswell of interest and support, a little bit of FOMO, fear of missing out from those girls by using, so having their current students use social media and promoting it to their networks. So what we're gonna do uh, over the course of the next 30 minutes or so is break down this ad right here that he ran according to the six pillars. So the six pillars are all embedded in this single Facebook ad campaign that he used to help fill his summer camp. So we'll continually revisit this as we go through each pillar. The first pillar is campaign objective. Now, when you're thinking about your objective or your goal for your digital marketing, it really boils down to something very simple. Your goal is to get people to give you their contact information so that you can stay in touch with them. And by their contact information, I mean their email address and their cell phone. That is the most valuable commodity in marketing. Not likes, not follows, not shares, email addresses and phone numbers. And the reason that you don't wanna simply rely on social media platforms, likes and shares to spread the word is because they own those relationships. You can't reach out to those people and communicate with them nearly as efficiently or effectively as you can if you have an email or a phone number. You can message them, uh, but it's harder to do that uh, at scale uh, and it's harder to make it systematic. Your number one marketing asset as a small business is your customer list. In fact, for many of us, our customer list is the main asset that we might one day sell if we ever sell our business. So the more careful you are about identifying qualified potential customers and then collecting their contact information, the more valuable a company you will have. So to translate getting contact info into digital marketing speak is your goal is to get qualified leads for your prospect list. 
A lead is just an email address or a cell phone number. A qualified lead simply means that they're likely to buy. In other words, they're your ideal target customer. A prospect list is just a contact list for your, for your customers and your potential customers. And the idea with your marketing is that you wanna provide value so that they feel inspired to give you their contact information and give you permission, as Seth Godin calls it, to stay in touch. So all of the digital marketing speak you might hear really can boil down to getting the contact information and permission to stay in touch with your ideal customer. Now, a lot of people will say, well, why do you need to collect emails if no one reads emails anymore? And it is true that just one in five emails on average are read. Now we did see a spike or have been seeing a spike during COVID-19, but we don't think that that will be forever. Um, a lot of people are in front of their computers a lot more than they used to be. And so uh, because they're not out and about as much, email open rates have gone up. And so email marketing has become more effective. Um, but you have to understand that an email address is far more than simply the ability to send an email. You can also upload these contact lists, these email addresses, these cell phone numbers into Facebook, into Google, into LinkedIn, into TikTok, and they will match profiles of those customers and you can then advertise to the folks on your customer list. This is an incredibly powerful way for you to reach them through a multiple channel approach. So if you have a list of customer names and email addresses, to start, you can email them, but you can also now run ads that are targeted just to them. So if you upload your customer list to Facebook, say, and then you run an ad to that custom audience, which is what they call it, that ad will only be seen by the matches on that customer list and no one else. It's an incredibly powerful way for you to get in front of those customers. Now, a lot of you will also object to collecting cell phone numbers. No one is picking up my calls. And I've definitely found this. It can be very hard to reach people through a phone call. 76 call percent of calls from an unknown number are not answered. However, in addition to being able to call, you can also text. And text messaging is actually the single most effective marketing channel in terms of open rate and how quickly people tend to open it. 98% of texts uh, are open and 90% of those texts are read within three minutes. So it's like a really immediate way of communicating with people. You also can use a cell phone number to get access to WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook. And that is larger than text message globally. So WhatsApp is actually bigger than text messaging um, by 50%. WhatsApp also is really important when you're communicating with certain populations, such as anyone who lives in Latin America or the Caribbean. WhatsApp is a very popular app uh, in those places and essential for your marketing. The other things that make cell phone numbers so powerful is those numbers rarely change. So even when people move jobs or move cities, they often keep their cell phone number. So it's a marketing asset that will have a much longer shelf life than an email address. And cell numbers can also be used to create custom audiences in Facebook and what Google calls those customer match audiences. So with a simple email address and a phone number, you can email them, you can call them, you can text them, you can WhatsApp them, you can um, do a custom audience on Facebook or Google or LinkedIn and run an ad towards them. There are so many different ways now with those two pieces of information that you can reach those folks with targeted messages. That's why we say that an email address and a phone number is marketing gold. Now, once you understand that your overall campaign objective is to collect leads, is to collect email addresses and phone numbers, all of your analytics should be in support of that. So when you're running campaigns, you need to look at what are the steps that people need to take in order to give you their contact information. For instance, if you're doing a post on social media or running a Facebook ad, do they click to your website? Do they fill out the form? That kind of thing. 
And I can tell you that a lot of us get mired in the data. There is so much data out there. Facebook alone has four different places where they have a massive amount of data. Ad Manager, where you can get data about your ads. Facebook Insights, where you can get data about your business page. Facebook Analytics, which connects up to your website and gives you data about your website if you have a pixel installed. And Events Manager, which if you've, if you've actually uh, programmed your pixel in certain ways, can allow you to track certain actions on your website and manage those there. It is an overwhelming amount of data, but the simple thing that you need to know is that whenever you choose a goal in a, fam in a Facebook campaign, whenever you choose a goal that automatically creates the KPI or the key performance indicator or the key result that they're optimizing for. So for instance, get more website visitors. They will measure the success of that campaign within Facebook by how many people click on a link. If you wanna boost a post, you'll, they'll measure the success through the number of likes. If you wanna get more messages, the key metric for that will be how many messages are sent. If you wanna get more leads, it's how many people fill out the form. What's so powerful about an ad is it's very easy to measure the success. It's very easy to know what the metric of success is and it's the campaign objective, the very first thing you do, the goal that you set that determines it. So we often recommend since lead generation is what many of you businesses are looking to do, we recommend that you run ads to get more leads. And Facebook has a really cool um, product that they offer, which is called the Facebook Lead Form, which allows you to actually collect contact information inside of Facebook, information that usually uh, is not shared or findable within Facebook. So you can actually have people fill out a little mini landing page inside of your Facebook ad, it's called a lead form, and then give you their contact information that way. Now, Facebook thinks about measuring success in a slightly different way. When you're running an ad campaign, so this is the most micro example, the, the success of that step in the ad, uh, that the success of that ad is determined by the goal that you set. But if you're a company, you also need to know how to measure your success. And there's a fabulous way uh, for how to think about this, which is called the North Star. What do you as a company use to measure your overall success? So for Facebook, it's monthly active users. So as the leader of a company, as the leader of Facebook, they're driving and optimizing everything they do to get more monthly active users. For WhatsApp, it's the number of people sending messages. For Airbnb, it's the number of nights booked. For eBay, it's gross merchandising volume. For BizHack, it's the number of businesses trained. This is a metric that will drive all of your marketing, all of your business. If you know that if, uh, like I know for BizHack, that if I have trained more businesses, we will do better financially. So the more businesses I can reach, the better we will do financially. Everything else will kind of fall in the line. So everything we do is driving towards that North Star and we communicate that with all of our uh, agencies, our partners, our contractors and our team to make sure that everybody understands that what we're up to. Then it's the magic moment. The North Star is almost always a measure of reach, volume, how many people are you touching? But what do you do when you touch them? That's the magic moment. That's that moment when people um, get hooked onto your service. So in addition to thinking about your North Star, I would also encourage you to think about your magic moment. So for Facebook, it's seeing your friends for the first time when you log in and seeing their activity. For WhatsApp, it's getting your first message. For Airbnb, it's finding that cool place. For eBay, if you're a sell buyer, it's finding that unique item. For eBay, if you're a seller, it's getting paid for the first time. It's like magic, right? And then for BizHack, our magic moment is the aha moment, is that moment of insight or inspiration that our teaching inspires. And we like to say at BizHack that we deliver more aha moments 
than any of our competitors. Uh, more aha moments per minute than any of our competitors. And we, when we look at our website, we say, how can we optimize for ahas? How can we get people more insights faster? So it's really an organizing principle for everything that we do. So I would be also thinking about what is your North Star and what is your magic moment? So we just talked about campaign objective and the metrics for, that matter and the success metrics at the highest level, North Star and magic moment, and at the lowest level, which is the campaign objective and the results that they're gonna optimize. Now that you've set your objective, you now need to find your ideal audience. And marketers call this process segmentation. You need to find groups of people, segments of your audience that are gonna be the most likely to buy from you. They're gonna have the highest return on investment. And the way to help think about this is those target audiences need to be definable, findable, profitable, have growth potential. And frankly, if you're a business owner, you need to enjoy serving them. No reason for you to try to target people that you don't enjoy serving. Now, marketers talk about four different ways to find your ideal audience. They call it geographic, demographic, behavioral, and psychographic. I think it's easier to just think of it as where, who, what, and why. Where do they live? Who are they? Uh, gender, ethnicity. What do they do? What are their behaviors? And why do they do it? What are their likes and interests? And Facebook and Google have really revolutionized the number of people you can reach for relatively small amounts of money um, through this process of segmentation, who you can target and how you target them. Uh, Facebook and Google have revolutionized the process and you have a lot of fast followers in LinkedIn owned by Microsoft, TikTok and many others who borrowed many of the breakthroughs that Google and Facebook pioneered and then applied them to their networks. So one of the powers of segmentation is there's a lot of discovery that can happen there. When most people think of millennials, you think of the hip annual, the I can make the world a better place millennial. But it turns out that they actually represent less than one third of all millennials. And that when you actually do research and data, you find out that there are uh, as many millennial moms and old school millennials as there are hip annuals. So though we tend to think of the largest segment as defining an audience, when you actually do the research, do the segmentation, you'll find uh, oftentimes some really interesting surprises. Now, next is who do you target, right? So if you're targeting millennials, you wouldn't want to target all six of these segments. You would want to pick a sub-segment to target with your ads. The trick with targeting is that you don't want to be too specific because then there aren't enough prospects for you to uh, approach. And you don't want to be so broad that your message is going to be diluted. So you're looking for that Goldilocks, that just right moment. And the way that we teach how to do this is through um, the, the following uh, strategy that we call the, um, the which, which starts with a golf retail store. So imagine you own a golf retail store and you want to find people who are looking to buy golf equipment. When we ask people what interests would you target, they often tell me, oh, Tiger Woods, the PGA, WPGA. This is a really common um, first response. If you want to find people who like golf, it makes sense to, tiger, uh, to, to target Tiger. But the problem is a lot of people who don't play golf are interested in Tiger Woods, follow Tiger Woods, know who Tiger Woods is, is he's too broad. He's gone from being a golf celebrity to just a celebrity. Um, and so there are a lot of, if you were just advertising to people who express an interest in Tiger Woods, the big risk is that you're going to get a lot of false positives, a lot of non-golfers in there. So what we look for is someone closer to Bubba Watson. Bubba Watson is a, the greatest left-handed shot maker in the history of golf. Uh, he is also someone who is generally not known uh, outside of golf enthusiasts. And that's the perfect, um, the perfect target is the enthusiast for golf, the person who plays golf or who has a spouse or father uh, or mother who plays golf. And so, 
we call this the but no one else would trick. We recommend that you um, find influencers or brands or industry associations that your ideal customer would know, but no one else would. And the better you do at targeting in that way, uh, you the better you will be at online marketing. Next, I want to talk about the irresistible offer. So the academic definition of marketing is a process to obtain what you want by creating, offering, and exchanging products of value with others. This is the, the um, business school definition of marketing by one of the fathers in the field, Philip Kotler. And I wanted to highlight the point about offer. An offer is an incentive. It's a way to get customers and prospects to stay in touch or make a purchase. It's a way essentially to get them to want to give you their contact information. And so in order for your marketing to be successful, one of the pillars is you have to give something of value to your ideal customer. And so your marketing must answer the question, what are you offering me? How much does it cost? What's in it for me? And why should I believe you? If your ideal customer doesn't have answers to those questions, the sale will not close. So we call this the irresistible offer. It's a concept that Mark Joyner talks about in his book. And an irresistible offer is an offer that's so good that you'd have to be a fool to pass it up. And so for BizHack's uh, uh, irresistible offer, we call it a course that pays for itself, a course that people who took it were able to actually get back their tuition on average within weeks of graduating. So um, whereas like I went to Princeton and I took out loans and it took me 10 years to pay for it, uh, many of the folks who take our programs, the course pays for itself. So that is our irresistible offer. And all of you need to really have a sense of an irresistible offer, that value proposition that you give. When it comes down to a Facebook ad, you want to have a free irresistible offer. The idea of a free irresistible offer is to inspire them to share their contact information. If a good free irresistible offer is, to, is something that says, if I were to put a price on this, would someone pay for it? So when we ask for examples of free irresistible offers, we get things like discounts, percentages off, buy one, get one free, a free gift if you buy something, or a white paper where you're giving out information, a quiz or survey where people are learning a little bit more about themselves, a live event or webinar where, like this where you're getting um, quality information in a live setting, um, a recorded um, lesson or webinar uh, is another way to give value, and a 30-minute consultation. A lot of B2B folks uh, offer consultations as a free or as to offer to get people in the door. This free irresistible offer is part of what we call the marketing funnel. You start with generating awareness about who you are, but in order for you to get a lead, you need to provide more value. And what I love about this is it shows at each stage in the marketing funnel, what offers can be that are appropriate for that phase in the journey. So you can see that for instance, when you're just raising awareness about who you are and what you do, tip sheets, white papers, press releases, blog posts. But if you're getting them down to the decision stage, that's where free trials, demos, consultations, and quotes and estimates become more important. So the deeper they are in the funnel, the more personalized and expensive the irresistible offer has to be in order to get them over the finish line. So there are different offers at different stages in the marketing journey. If they're an unknown person, you definitely need to have uh, a free irresistible offer uh, to help get, take them from someone who's unknown to known. Once they have that free irresistible offer, then we have what's called the foot in the door offer. The foot in the door offer is something a little bit more personalized and more, a little bit more intensive. That might be the 30 minute consultation. Then the main product is what comes next. And you wanna um, often, um, offer them maybe a discount on the first sale or some package to get them to buy more. And then finally, the fourth kind of offer is the upsell offer, which is you have existing customers 
and you want to get them to refer or to buy again, um, and you want to have opportunity, like a program or an offer to do that. So loyalty programs, referral programs, all of those live uh, in this bucket of the upsell. So for instance, with BizHack Academy, we have our free irresistible offer, which is webinars like this, our foot in the door offer, where we periodically will offer an hour of free coaching with me, and then our main product, which is our five week program, which we offer scholarships to help defray a portion of the cost for certain um, minority and women led businesses. And then finally, for folks who've gone through the program, we offer additional coaching and additional courses so they can continue their learning journey. So the free irresistible offer from Ascendance Studio was a free trial class on a Saturday. Their target audience, by the way, was moms uh, with children uh, ages five to nine. Next is the thumb stopping video, pillar five. By thumb stopping, we mean that when you're sitting there and you're scrolling on your phone, you wanna have people stop and watch your video. So the first one to three seconds are critical in the success of a video ad. The ads, them, the videos themselves should only last 12 to 15 seconds. And we definitely don't recommend that you hire a videographer. You should aim to spend just 30 minutes making your video. And you'd be like, well, how is that possible? Uh, well, the reason that's possible is because there's some amazing software out there that allow you to take still images or video clips and quickly stitch them together into a rough and ready video ad. Uh, we call that fail fast, fail cheap. The reason we say that you don't want to spend much money or time on creating a video for your ad is because you don't know if it's going to work. You have to test it. And so if you overinvest in the video creation, you're actually going to be wasting a lot of time and money. And there are a couple different tools that we recommend uh, for building videos quickly. The two that we recommend in our five-week program is Lumen 5, which offers a really simple way to make a video ad in minutes, and Canva. Canva is an incredible graphic design tool that recently introduced uh, the ability for you to build uh, social media video ads um, inside of their system. And both of them offer you access to tons of stock images and stock video, and they're relatively simple to learn and use. So it's an incredible resource. And then finally, there is something in Facebook called the Video Creation Kit, where you actually can build your own ads directly inside of Facebook. And you can see that they give you the optimum number of images and number of seconds. And you, when you look at this, you can see two to five images, six seconds. So they're very short these videos that we're talking about that are most effective when you're doing a uh, Facebook ad. So we talked about the thumb stopping video and now we're gonna talk about the compelling message. The compelling message in the case of Ascendant Studios was to move with the minions and to get minion goggles giveaway as part of joining the, the free class. So, the compelling message is really challenging because the web is a crowded place. 60 seconds on the web, it, all of this content is being uploaded and created and shared from uh, 5 million videos viewed on YouTube to 300,000 status updates. There's just a cacophony of messaging that's happening on, uh, on Facebook, on, on social media, on the web. And you are trying to be one of those voices, lone voices in the wilderness. Where you really need to be with your messaging is right in that intersection of what you want and what the buyer wants. You need to be there, you need to be timely, relevant, and authentic. Your compelling messaging needs to help buyers discover relevant content, learn how you can help with their needs, try or experience your offering, and then buy your offering in a frictionless way. We believe at BizHack that content is the fuel that powers the buyer experience. In other words, if you can give value by giving relevant content to your ideal customer, they will repay you with their contact information and ultimately their purchase. Finally, uh, there is the call to action. And the call to action is the thing that gets them from the ad to the next step 
in their journey. And you can see when you're creating a Facebook ad, you have different options of different calls to action, like learn more. What I love about the call to action is when you started this process of building this Facebook campaign, you started with a uh, campaign objective, right? Whether it was to drive traffic to your website or to get people to um, you know, like or share your post or to get them to fill out a, a, a lead form. The call to action is at the end of creating the other five pillars, you then need to actually tell them, please do this thing. And this thing is your campaign objective. So it creates a beautiful circle. And the call to action is uh, one of my favorite pieces of language in all of marketing. Uh, it really speaks to the goal of all marketing, which is to get people to act. One of the biggest mistakes that a lot of folks make when they're starting out in marketing is they'll send emails without a call to action. So if you send an email and you're not directing someone to do something, you really should ask yourself, why am I sending this email? Whether it's to visit your blog or to register for an event, your, your emails, uh, all of your marketing should have a call to action, something you want them to do. And what the call to action does is it kicks people into the next step of the customer journey. So really the customer journey begins this, the process of selling to strangers begins with a Facebook ad, but that Facebook ad might send them to a landing page on your website. If they fill it out, they'll get a thank you email that would then direct them to your main website. You might retarget them with Google ads or, or your Yelp listing. You might follow up with them via email or phone. The Facebook ad is really just the first step in the journey and the call to action and each step in the process is what kicks you to the next step in that journey. And that's how they go from being a stranger to a prospect to ultimately a customer. So when you're thinking about Facebook and you're thinking about Facebook ads, it starts off with the ad and it ends hopefully with a sale or at least a no thanks. That's kind of an ideal scenario. What happens in between we call the messy middle, another name for the customer journey. It can be very messy when you're going from collecting, you know, advertising on Facebook to get driving a sale. Oftentimes that can take months or even years. They might go through your website. They might go to your social media. They might get on a phone call. Rare is it that the customer goes always through the exact same journey. But when you're mapping or thinking about the customer journey, you always want to kind of, just like you're talking about an ideal customer, you want to talk about a uh, typical customer journey. It is an approximation, but it really helps you as a marketer think through the customer experience of being onboarded uh, to your company. So um, what you have to understand is that even after you then make that first sale, you have the whole customer journey for the upsell. So this is why marketing can be hard, why it can be time consuming, but also at its core, it can be relatively simple to understand. And that's really what our goal here is with the BizHack Lead Building System is to give you a simple framework to think about what's being done. We generally recommend that once business owners have kind of mastered the lead building system, that they hire people to manage the messy middle because it can be very time consuming to market to um, new customers and to upsell existing customers. So when you're starting out mapping your customer journey and thinking about your call to action, you should identify what are the typical touch points before an ideal customer makes a purchase. And then you should give them um, motivation to get through each stage in the journey. So for instance, in the Facebook ad that, uh, that Raphael ran, his call to action was to sign up by clicking on this button or to call by calling that number. So he had two calls to action embedded in the ad to sign up or to call. So now that we've gone through the six pillars, then there's the nine step process that we have developed to help you implement this. We call this nine step process, run an ad, run another ad. And this is what the BizHacks five week program does is we give you implementation support and coaching to run through these nine steps. It starts with creating a persona and building an audience, creating a video, running your first 
awareness uh, ad, usually a video views objective, mapping out the customer journey, determining a free irresistible offer, analyzing and optimizing that first ad, learning from it and doing better, building a second ad that's about lead generation, launching that second ad, analyzing and optimizing that second ad. Hopefully at that point you've generated some qualified leads for your business and now it's up to you to close the sale. So the foundation is the business story. The six pillars are what every campaign needs in order to be successful. And then the nine steps is a step-by-step -step proven process uh, for actually achieving those results. The BizHack program, we call it Earn While You Learn. In five weeks, you run targeted ads uh, with one-on-one -on -one help from experts and support from your peers. And our philosophy is that adults learn by doing and adults learn from one another. So we really focus on forcing you and holding you accountable to do the work, to run through the nine steps, and then to have the support and the um, education, not only of experts, but other peer business owners. In our program, we cover more than just Facebook advertising. Facebook advertising, as you remember, is just a learning tool, but all the homework is related to running a real life campaign. The classes cover a much broader array of topics, including Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, SEO, pricing strategy, email nurture campaigns, analytics, and more. So we've really figured out what are the topics that any small business marketer is gonna to need to know. And then the work of the course is to actually run through one ad and then another ad. And that is the BizHack lead building system. And that is the process that we work on with you. There are nearly 30 hours of live instruction that we include in the class. Uh, 10 classes held on Mondays and Thursdays, uh, labs held once a week on Wednesday afternoons. You get uh, assigned your own dedicated marketing coach who works with you in the labs as well as the coaching sessions. We also have an extensive video library, a graduation celebration, and a very active uh, community conversation happening on Facebook and WhatsApp. At the end of the time uh, in our program, you get an industry certification, a certificate of completion with BizHack. And one of the things that we really are looking for when we're talking to potential uh, participants in the course is called the BizHacker mentality. And what we say is that BizHack offers a high paced, high impact program for people who embrace new challenges, who work their tail off, who continuously experiment and try new things and who treat failure as an opportunity to learn. We teach you how to have this mentality. We also look for folks with this mentality when we are uh, building up our program through our application process. The biz hacker mentality is really the mentality you need to digitally market successfully. One where you're willing to experiment and embrace the new patience and perseverance and, and attitude towards learning. We summarize this as the willingness to dare to fail gloriously um, with uh, the support of experts and peers and in a safe learning environment. And one of my uh, favorite biz hackers is Shakira Johnson. She's someone who uh, was uh, voted by her peers as having the biz hacker mentality. She won the biz hacker award or our highest award and her uh, presentation ended with never say die, which is a, 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 an incredible motto uh, for the moment in which we live. Um, we do offer for anyone who does decide to go through our program, a money back guarantee. This isn't a guarantee that you're going to make money immediately on ads. Every business is different. Every business is more or less ripe. What the guarantee is, is that if you show up and do the work, you will get the results. You will learn a proven system and be put on a better path to helping market and sell to strangers. The lead instructor of the course is Alex de Carvalho, formerly of global, uh, glo head of global social media for IBM and a director at Constant Contact. He started an email marketing company when I was still in college. Uh, and he taught one of the first classes in social media marketing worldwide at the University of Miami. He also happens to be uh, a diplomat. He's the honorary consul of Finland and is a, is a great 
um, friend and partner and uh, an incredible instructor. And he works with our amazing teaching team. Each of you will be assigned, if you do go through the program, your own personalized marketing coach. These are some of the marketing coaches that we have each semester. Uh, they change based on uh, their availability and the profile of the students going through the course. And so let's go back to Rafael Savino and look at the results of his ad campaign. So as you'll remember, his, um, his summer camp uh, had problems with filling the later half of it. Well, the uh, summer camp, uh, when he applied these principles, uh, had a fill rate of 80% compared to 60% the year before. The enrollment was up 50% in the later summer. Their idle capacity was down and more than double the number of people enrolled in six or more weeks because of the pricing strategy they put into place. U ultimately, they got a nearly double revenue what they had the year before by implementing these sets of strategies. So I wanna talk now about next steps. Um, if you are interested in joining our upcoming cohort, which starts on Monday, you can apply for a scholarship if you haven't already by going to try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. If you have already applied for a scholarship and you'd like to schedule an application interview with me, you can go to calendly.com slash bizhack slash apply, and that'll allow you to actually have direct access to my calendar to talk about our payment plans and determine if the program is a fit. Um, we then want you to reserve your seat and uh, we're gonna be doing the BizHack Live every Wednesday at 12.30 as a community service now and into the future. And we want you to continue to come and join us for that. Um, now, today is a big day uh, in our nation's history and I wanna um, give you this parting thought before I open it up to questions, which is um, today we just inaugurated a new president. And so in honor of a past president, uh, I want to share one of my favorite quotes, which is from John F. Kennedy. He said, when write written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. So with COVID-19, with the economic downturn, with the massive levels of unemployment, with the endangered state of many small businesses, the danger is very clear and very obvious. Um, for more than 400,000 people have died and at least that many small businesses are now out of business. One estimate puts nearly a quarter of all small businesses have gone under as a result of COVID. There is at the same time opportunity in this crisis and the opportunity is for you to pivot your business, to adapt it to 21st century marketing and the need, the evolving needs of the customers. And if you're able to adapt, if you're able to meet that opportunity, your likelihood of survival and even thriving in this situation is huge. So when we think about crisis, it's very easy to get caught up in the danger, but I do want you to understand that there is also uh, opportunity and I invite you to grasp that opportunity. Thank you guys so much for joining me on uh, on a busy inauguration day. I really appreciate you and your time and attention and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that might've come up. Thank you guys so much. And I hope to talk to many of you and see many of you in class that starts on Monday.